the way they will be in just a few moments. So would you join me in giving Russ Miller a welcome and give the Lord a hand for bringing him here this morning. Russ. Thank you, Jason. Good morning. It is true that my wife and I are blessed to live in an extinct uh, volcanic crater in northern Arizona. It's nothing like what you probably have pictured in your mind. It's a great place to be. But I want to go ahead and get into today's message. It's a message about uh, end times. You know, the signs of the last days as portrayed in the Bible, are converging all around us today, converging together like they never have in human history. I think it's safe to say we're getting close to the rapture, whether that's today or 50 years from today, I can't say, but we certainly see everything converging. But the number one last day's prophecy of all, in my opinion, the most important one given to us by Jesus Christ himself, is hardly being discussed. And that prophecy was that in the last days, false Christs shall arise. So I think today, well, it's always important, but especially today, I think we need to have a good understanding of how a person is saved. And how do we know absolute assurance that we are saved and sealed with Jesus Christ? You know, I've talked to Christians about this, and I might get... 300 different answers on this. So I said, let's go to the Bible. I went to 1 Corinthians 15, where Paul tells us, I declare unto you the gospel by which you are saved, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So if you believe that Jesus Christ of the Bible died and rose the third day, according to the word of God, according to the scriptures, once you've heard the gospel, you understand the gospel, and you believe the message you have heard, well, the really great thing is that Jesus sends his Holy Spirit into your heart, and you are sealed with that message. You are saved, and you are sealed. That's the cherry on top of the eternal fudge Sunday, as I like to say. <laughs> so, how is a person assured that they are saved and they are sealed? By simply believing Jesus, believing in Jesus that he died and rose again for your sins according to the scriptures. You believe in the Jesus of the Bible. But Paul warns us in 2 Corinthians 11, 3 and 4, but I fear, he fears, but I fear lest by any means as a serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that comes preaches another Jesus, or you receive another spirit or another gospel, you might bear with him. Well, wait a minute, as a serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety? Very subtle. Satan doesn't come to you like some red, what we picture a devil with horns and a pitchfork. No, he's going to come to you sounding like the best Christian you've ever met in your life. He can disguise himself as an angel of light. And what is what's this corrupted minds from the simplicity that is in Christ? Other Jesuses, other spirits, other gospels. Let's take a closer look at 2 Corinthians 11, 3 and 4. But I fear. What is it that, that causes Paul to fear? I fear lest by any means as a serpent beguiled thee through his subtlety. Satan plants doubt in people's minds. He gets to undermine your faith by asking questions. The first question posed in the Bible in Genesis 3, Satan approaches Eve in the garden and says, Hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree in the garden? And look where that one question has led us to today in the outside world. Wow, he plants doubt and corrupts the simplicity of Christ by asking questions. Jesus said, the devil abides not in the truth because there's no truth in him. He is a liar and the father of lies. Now, sola scriptura is the principle that the Bible is the sole infallible authority for Christian faith, especially with regard to who Jesus Christ is. And today, more than ever before in human history, we need to be like the Bereans of old and compare any, anything we think, we see, we're taught, we're told, etc., to God's word to make sure it's in line with God's word per sola scriptura. 
Back to 2 Corinthians 11. I fear so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. It's so easy to, to stay on that narrow pathway, just read God's word and believe what he tells you, especially about who Jesus is. So per sola scriptura, who is the son of God according to the scriptures? Well, in the book of John, it starts out, in the beginning was the word, and we're told that all things were made by the word of God. So the word of God is our creator. The creator is the word of God. Do you see that? And then we're told that the word of God, our creator, was made flesh and dwelt among us. The word of God, our creator, is who? Jesus Christ. Jesus is first our divine biblical creator. In fact, how important is this to Jesus that we accept him and worship him as the creator that he is? I want to give you five big hitters. I mean slam dunks on how important this is. First of all, the first five words of the Bible, the first five words of the book, God declares he's the creator. In the beginning, God created. The first thing he does is declare himself to be the creator, and it takes him five words to do it. In the middle of the Ten Commandments, etched into stone by God's very own finger, he declares, for in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the seas, and all that in them is. In the middle of the Ten Commandments, on the day of his resurrection, he approaches the two disciples. They, he had told them he would have to die and rise again on the third day. They've heard he's risen on the third day, and they don't even believe it. They're leaving. They're heading out of, out of Jerusalem toward Emmaus. So Jesus approaches his two doubting disciples on the day of his resurrection. Who does he begin teaching them with? with Moses on the day of his resurrection. I have no doubt he had to give them the foundation of why he had to, had to die on a cross and rise again to redeem us with him because our sin had separated us from him. And the last time the gospel is mentioned is in Revelation 14. What, what, it's being held by, by an angel. Well, what's that angel doing the last, with the gospel? The last time the gospel is mentioned... That angel is exhorting the people on earth to worship the creator. The first time we're told about the elders in heaven falling down to worship God, we're told that they fall down before God and cast their golden crowns at the throne of the creator. I think it's vital we understand and worship Jesus as the creator he claims to be. Now, John and Paul both told us that the father judges no man but has committed all judgment to Jesus. So the biblical Jesus is our divine creator and he's our divine judge. Now he tells us he's already judged man's sin once already with a flood that covered all the high hills under the whole heaven. That would be a global flood. Now Pastor Paul, he told me I could be perfectly honest with you all today. Is that okay? Can I, can I be perfectly honest? You're sure? Okay. Remember, Pastor Paul, blame it on him. But Let's be honest with ourselves. If there had been a worldwide flood, the evidence would be overwhelming. There should be nothing to even argue about. I would think if the fountains of the deep erupted for 150 days, they would have eroded the top mile to two miles of the Earth's original crust. And with those waters rolling around the planet for 150 to 300 days before they got laid down again, the, the waters would have separated the sediments by grain size, weight, and density. Much like a miner grabs some sediments in a pan, sloshes it back and forth, the water separates the sediments by grain size, weight, and density. Gold being the densest falls to the bottom. Well, on a global scale, we would, the outer crust of the earth after a flood wouldn't be just one big brown conglomerate like it formed slowly over millions of years. You'd have stratified layers. You'd have all the sand grains would have gotten together, all the mudstone grains, all the shell grains would have gotten together, we would have these stratified layers making up the crust of the earth. Well, what do we find today? The outer crust of the earth averages a mile deep of stratified layers separated by grain size, weight, and density by moving water, and they're full of billions of dead things that were drowned and buried so quickly they didn't even have time to rot away or get eaten by scavengers. We call those things fossils today. Exactly what would be there if the word of God were true, and the word of God is true word for word and cover to cover. 
This is actually the entire linchpin in the war of worldviews, whether that there was a global flood. You'll see that here in just a couple minutes. But also as our divine judge, because he loves us, he put the death sentence we deserved on himself and became our divine savior, who shed his blood on a cross so our sins could be re, uh, forgiven, who rose again on the third day to defeat death for eternity, and who now sits on the right hand of the Father as our intercessor. Now, the Jesus, according to the scriptures, is our creator. Because he's our creator, he owns us. That gives him the right to be our judge. And as our loving judge, he put the death sentence we deserve on himself and became our savior. This is the Jesus of the Bible. This is Jesus according to the scriptures. And the only thing he asks of us is to believe in him. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him, do you think it's important to believe in him? We'll have eternal life with him in heaven. And not because we deserve it. We don't deserve it at all. Because he loves us and he sacrificed himself for us. Back to 2 Corinthians 11. If you receive another spirit. Well, in 1 John we're told, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Well, how do you test a spirit? The Spirit of God will always lead you to his word. It will always lead you to believe in the Jesus of the scriptures. The Holy Spirit will always bring you to God, to Jesus. It will never put confusion in your mind. It will never try to mislead you. If it's confusing you or misleading you or getting you to doubt what the word of God tells us, that's a false spirit. Back to 2 Corinthians 11. For if he that comes preaches another Jesus, another Jesus? Well, think about it. If you were Satan and you know people are saved for eternity by believing in Jesus, think maybe you'd put some false Jesuses out there to get people to believe a false one? That's one of the first things I would do. You know, one of the great prophecies in the New Testament found in 2 Peter 3, and this is the reason I say the global flood's the whole linchpin in the war of worldviews. We're told another last day's prophecy. In the last days, scoffers will come along. I'm going to paraphrase this. They're going to claim uniform processes and deny there was ever a global flood. Why would you care about the global flood? Well, you see, today the foundation of secular worldviews are the millions of years' beliefs. Now, these were only invented about 220 years ago, and they're based on those stratified layers laid down by water. They just say, wait a minute, those layers laid down by water didn't form in a flood. There was never a flood. No, they form slowly and uniformly at the rate we see them form today, which is about one inch every 10,000 years. Yeah, so they deny the global flood and claim uniform processes just like the Word of God said they would do. Wow. So this has taken over uh, what's taught as science for the last 170 years, saying man evolved over millions of years of death and suffering. Well, in 2 Timothy, Paul warns us, evil men and seducers will wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. You know, I think one of our strongest points is finger-pointing. We're all experts at finger-pointing at others, aren't we? I mean, I do it all the time. Look at that guy over there. Look at this guy over here. But the problem is when we point our fingers at someone else, we've got three fingers pointing back at us. You know, Jesus warns us about this. Don't point out the speck in your brother's eye when you ignore the plank in our own eye, right? So it is an issue for us. You know, we talk about false Christ, but we, we want to point outside of what we consider to be Christian circles. Oh, we'll point at the Jehovah's Witnesses or the Mormons and we'll say they're deceived. They've been led to, to believe in a different Jesus, so they're not saved. But, well, they believe Jesus died and rose again. Why aren't they saved? Because they've denied the biblical Jesus and replaced him with their own Jesus. But the issue for us is that when we're finger pointing outside, we've got all these different Christ pointing back at us inside. You know, today we've got the young earth Christ, the theistic evolution, progressive creation, and the gap theory Christs. Well, I've been talking to folks for about 20 years about this issue, and God's been working on me and working on me. And finally, I put this message together for this weekend to try to help people with this. But 
I started using sugar packets when I'd be in a restaurant talking to somebody about this. And I'd use the different color sweetener packets to, to make a, a visual that really had a profound impact with folks I showed this to. I wanted to use sugar packets up here, but you guys wouldn't be able to see them from where you are. So I came up with this visual. I want to compare the four Christs I just mentioned together, and let's see how they line up. What we call the young earth Christ is uh, one that says, well, he created in six days, resting on the seventh, and it was man's sin that corrupted his creation, bringing death into the world, and that he judged the world with a flood that covered all the high hills under the whole heaven, a global flood. Now, the theistic evolution Christ, he says he evolved this over millions of years of time, and it wasn't man's sin that brought in death, it was death that brought in man, and it wasn't a global flood, it was just a local flood. They deny the flood. The progressive creation Christ isn't much different than the theistic evolution one, but he created over millions of years of time, and again, it was death was the good tool he used to bring man along. It wasn't man's sin that brought in death, and again, that flood, it was just a local flood, not a global flood. Now, the first attempt to fit the uh, secular belief based on the geologic time scale of millions of years of time into God's word was the gap theory where there was actually a whole different creation. I call it the non-biblical creation. And Satan and his minions messed it up so bad, God judged that with a non-biblical global flood. And then that's where they pick up with the Bible where God creates in six days. And follow me on this. He just described destroyed the other creation because of Satan and his minions. So now he comes back and he creates in six days, leaves it full of Satan and his minions, and calls it very good. That just doesn't make any sense to me. And they say, oh, death existed for billions of years before Adam, and the flood of the days of Noah was either not a global flood or it left no evidence behind because they attribute the evidence to the biblical flood that I just showed you to their non-biblical flood. Well, all three on the right, the multicolored ones, they uh, not, are not found in the Bible, unless you tr twist and contort words. Um, but they, are, they all came along after the geologic timescale was invented. They're trying to fit the geologic timescale based on uniform processes and no global flood into God's word. But the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians, your faith should not stand in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. In Matthew 7, Jesus has just warned us to beware of wolves dressed as sheep. They're going to look like sheep. They're going to be the best-looking sheep you've ever run into. But Jesus says they're there to, to destroy you. And he tells us how to tell who they are. He, he tells us you tell good from bad, good from evil, by the fruit, what they produce. Well, the fruit of old earth beliefs invented 220 years ago, the number one fruit was Darwinism. It's a fruit coming off this teaching. These two beliefs, millions of years leading to Darwinism, have combined to provide the modern foundation for naturalism, atheistic humanism, the eventual removal of prayer and creation from our schools 61 years ago, which immediately led to the sexual revolution and the drug culture and the abortion industry, it's now led to homosexual marriage and now transgenderism, and who knows what's coming next. These are all fruits coming from those old earth beliefs based on denying the global flood and claiming uniform processes. I don't think I want to attribute this foundation to Jesus Christ. I think that's a dangerous place to be. In fact, Jesus said, many will come in my name saying, I am Christ, and deceive many. Do you catch that warning from Jesus? You know, I think we picture somebody out in a field on a podium saying, I am Christ. But actually, I think it's much more subtle and devastating. You see, each of these four versions of Jesus say, I am the Christ. I suffered and died on a cross shedding my blood to cover your sin. But let me ask you a question. How many Christs died on that cross? Very good, absolutely. So, so all four of these weren't up there, were they? Future creation speaker right here. There was one, and per the word of God, per sola scriptura, 
Which one of these is the divine son of God? Is it this one? How about this one? How many want to bet your eternal foundation on salvation on this one? Or how many think maybe it's this one right here? You know, in 1 Peter, Peter warns us, be sober and vigilant because your adversary, the devil, is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, who he may deceive, who he may destroy. See, he doesn't have to get you to deny Jesus Christ if he can get you to worship a false one. Per the word of God, this, on the left, is the son of God. And he's not the young earth creationist. He's God. He's the biblical God. Now, people come up to me, oh, you're one of those young earth creationists. And I'll, I'll look confused. I'll say, uh, oh, yeah. oh, you mean Bible believer? Yeah, I'm a Bible believer. That's right. Because I'm trying to make a point. Today, we think we can just make up any Jesus we want, and that's a dangerous place to be. Per the word of God, these other three were all invented to fit the geologic time scale that puts death before Adam based on uniformity and no global flood into the word of God, but they never existed. They never breathed a breath. They never had one heartbeat. They are absolute images in people's minds. Do you see that? They never existed. In fact, we're told in the last days, in the last days prophecy, perilous times shall come, shall, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, proud, boastful of their secular indoctrination, or I mean education. And they'll, they'll be claiming, well, I believe in millions of years their crust formed slowly, there was never a global flood. But it goes on and says they're going to have a form of godliness. They're not going to say they're atheists. They're going to have a, a form of God. But it's not exactly God because... They're denying his power. Oh, I, I believe in God, but he couldn't have created in six days or judged man's sin with a flood that covered all the high hills under the whole heaven. They are making up their own form of God. And the Bible says, from such, turn away. Back to 2 Corinthians 11. If you receive another gospel, the foundation of the gospel message is found in Genesis 1 and 3. I call this the cost. That God gave us a perfect creation have you ever had someone ask you, how could there be a, a loving God? This world is full of death and suffering. Have you ever heard something along those lines? Well, here's the biblical answer. It's very simple. It's right there in Genesis 1 and 3. God didn't give us the creation the way it is today, full of death and suffering. God gave us a perfect creation. What happened to it was Adam's first sin. Adam's original sin brought on the curse that allowed death to enter. And that's why we live in a world full of death today, but we have a loving God. Simple answer, and there it is. It's been lost because of old earth beliefs. See, once you put death before Adam, you can't teach Adam sin brought in death. Do you see that? Did I mention the Bible says Satan is very subtle but devastating? But that original sin is also what separated us from God, requiring our redemption with him, but we can't redeem ourselves with God because we have to be 100% sinless our entire life, and we're all born with a sin nature. So how loving is God? Despite our sin that corrupted his creation, he sent his only begotten son to suffer and die on a cross. His shed blood covering our sin. And the only thing he asks us to do is believe in him. So Satan's going to do everything he can to get you either not to believe in him or to believe in a false Christ and think you're okay. See, once you put death before Adam, like all those other beliefs I just mentioned do, you can't answer the question, how can we have a loving God in a world full of death? You can't teach billions of years of death existed for, before man and then say man's sin brought in death. Do you see that? Ooh, subtle but devastating. Paul said, I marvel you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ to another gospel. But it's not exactly another gospel. It, it's, a, it's a perverted gospel. I mean, it sounds almost like the real gospel, but it's not. It's twisted. It, it's perverted. And today's foundation for perverted gospels is almost always starting out with billions of years belief based on uniform processes and no global flood excepting the secular teachings, and they all put death before Adam. And that, my friends, is a perverted gospel because when you accept that, you tend to accept one of those non-biblical Christs. And when you have a non-biblical Christ, you've got another gospel. 
You know, the signs of the last days are converging around us. Yet again, the number one last days prophecy that false Christ shall arise is being almost completely ignored. In fact, quite frankly, I'm the only person I know that really talks about this. In Matthew, the disciples asked Jesus, what would be the sign of thy coming and the end of the world, the last days? And he said, take heed that no man deceive you. False Christ shall arise. And today over 90% of accredited Christian colleges and seminaries are teaching one of these or more of these non-biblical Christs. Wow. No wonder Peter said, there shall be false teachers among you. And the result of this, a recent survey showed that only 38% of pastors hold a biblical worldview. Only 12% of youth and college pastors and only 3% of Christian adults hold a biblical worldview today. Over 90% of today's Christians have been misled and do not hold a biblical worldview. Now, it doesn't mean they've all accepted a false Christ, but the majority of that 90% have. And they're not evil people. They're as true a seeker as anybody in this room at this very moment. But they've been misled by false teachers. You know, you've got wolves dressed as sheep. You've got tares among the wheat. You even have some real wheat that are teaching these things. So they've been so misled. But Jesus told his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous. And today, the harvest is plenteous inside of Christian churches. When I get into a church, and 98% of them block my information, by the way, but when I do get into one that's never heard this before, it blows the roof off the place. People want this information. They don't even know it exists. It's being blocked from them. Christianity today, certainly not a, a fan of biblical creation. They've been telling people to attack creationists for years now. They gave a recent award for apologetics and evangelism to a theistic evolutionist who openly mocks the book of Genesis is mytho-history. Well, there's a lot of problems there. Jesus referred to Genesis as factual history 20 times. Every writer of the New Testament refers back to Genesis as historically factual. It's referred to over 200 times in the New Testament alone. Either this guy's right or Jesus Christ and every writer of the New Testament is right. You know, a scoffer got a hold of me. He, want, he and his skeptic buddy wanted to debate me on their blog site about the age of the earth and show how the Bible's not trustworthy. The scoffer was a well-known atheist blogger. His skeptical buddy is a Christian college professor. Check out these two emails. Compare them. I got this email from an atheist who said, you're such an idiot. Well, I already knew that, so I'm like, well, what's the news here? Then I read further, it says, the Bible isn't meant to be taken literally, it's allegorical. A week later, I got this email from a Christian parent who said, my son's at a Christian college that's teaching God use long ages of time and evolution, and the Bible isn't meant to be taken literally, it's allegorical. After the first service this morning, a man met me outside, and he said, my son went off to a Christian college, he wanted to become a professor, and the Christian college convinced him the Bible isn't meant to be taken literally, it's allegorical and destroyed his faith. Here's an email I got from a pastor in Colorado. He called me as well. He said, our high school is a staunch promoter of Darwinism. The two biology teachers are lesbian lovers, and they've misled many Christian kids. So I went to a citywide pastor's meeting to announce my intention to bring you in and show the Bible's true. And when I said that, the other 19 pastors stood up and walked out of the meeting. That I mentioned 98% of churches blocked this information who jesus is has become a non-essential think about this it's become a non-essential believe in any jesus you want in today's lukewarm church in fact jesus has the angel to the church of laodiceans the last day's church introduce him as the creator hey the beginning of the creation is standing out here and where's jesus he's outside he's knocking saying let me in and he says to them I know thy works, and because you are lukewarm, I will spit you out of my mouth. Some versions say vomit you from my mouth. That doesn't sound like a good place to be with your Savior, does it? But then Jesus changes direction and tells them, Look, I'm chastising you and rebuking you because I care about you. I love you. Please, ask me in, and I will come in. But he's not in there right now because most likely they are accepting false Christ. And it, rejecting 
the creator. Christians are in Satan's crosshairs, leaving us with two choices. Trust in one of the man-made, non-biblical versions of Christ, or trust in the Jesus according to the scriptures. I came up with a false teacher test. It's very simple. Don't pay attention to how they dress or how they talk or how well they know the Bible. Satan knows it inside and out. It's not a matter of how famous they are or are not. They might have a church of 50 people or 500,000 people. They might have the number one best-selling Christian book or the number one Christian song in the nation. That is not what you look for. Look for one thing. Are they leading you to the Jesus of the Bible? If they are promoting you and trying to get you to worship a different Christ, you need to run away screaming at the top of your lungs. Because they have passed the test. And my friends, if the age of the earth is an issue or a challenge for you, it is for most people. That's all it's taught today. My message, Top Ten Old Earth Beliefs, my book, Cost, will really help you greatly, including with Darwinism. Um, We have various... uh, resources out there for kids. I don't copyright my DVDs or my thumb drives. We even have a couple of thumb drives and DVDs especially made for you to get make copies and give them to everybody you know with my five top teachings in the order I would present them. Or go on one of our Grand Staircase tours through Compass International here in Coeur d'Alene. Uh, you can find out about that through Pastor Paul as well. Let me end with this from 2 Timothy. This is everything we've been talking about. Paul says... The Holy Scriptures make you wise into salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. So how is a person assured that they are saved and sealed? By believing in Jesus, that he died for our sins and rose the third day according to the word of God. And the only Jesus found in Scriptures claims to have created in six days resting on the seventh, judging man's sin with a flood that covered all the high hills under the whole heaven because of man's continuing sin. He came to earth born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, died on a cross, shedding his blood to cover our sin, and he rose again the third day. He now sits on the right hand of the Father. This is the only Jesus found in the Bible. This is the only Jesus who was born of a virgin, whoever walked the shore of the Sea of Galilee, whoever calmed the seas, healed a leper, arose Lazarus from the dead. This is the Jesus according to the scriptures, and he is coming back soon. Put your trust in him and none other. Uh, Pastor Jason.